Hey, hello. Welcome to episode number 115 of the People We Love podcast. I am Adam Choit. What's up? If you are new here, what I do is interview people from all walks of life. Most often comedians and other artists about their lives and careers. The conversation is casual, but I also ask everyone to highlight the people they love, who they admire, who influenced them, inspire them, or supported them. For more, check out peoplewelovepodcast.com. That's peoplewelovepodcast.com. And the Instagram handle is at peoplewelovepodcast. And you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Adam Choit is, uh, is my handle for those things. And please remember to tap subscribe or follow on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. And of course, five-star positive reviews on iTunes, Apple Podcasts are very much greatly appreciated as well. So today's guest is author, motivational speaker, trainer, and consultant, David Richmond. Originally from LA, now residing in Vegas, David tells me all about his challenging uh, upbringing as a kid as we dive pretty deep into some of the bad luck as well as uh, poor choices he has made over the years. But some time after his sister became terminally ill, he was greatly affected and decided it was time to make some changes in his own life. So an overweight smoker became an amazing athlete. And along the way, David found it was important to dive deeper into the emotional aspect of dealing with cancer, and his book Cycle of Lives was born, which chronicles his uh, bicycle ride that covered 4,700 miles as he visited the participants of his book, 15 people who were affected by cancer, either as patients, doctors, researchers, caregivers, or otherwise. And David tells me all about, uh, all about those people. And uh, let's just get started. Here's David Richman. Okay, so it's good to see you today. David Richman, thank you for uh, joining me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, Adam. I love it. Let's talk. Oh, oh for sure. How are you holding up uh, during uh, whatever the year it is? Oy, oy, oy. Uh, you know, it's all good and bad. Um, uh, I, I say I'm holding up well, but um, boy, haven't we all been through some changes. Um, but yeah, I taking this time to like take a deep breath and transform and come out hopefully stronger the other side. Right. It's it's crazy. It's been crazy times, though. No doubt. I feel like people are going in one way, one direction or the other, the, the sort of positive uh personal development, at least in some areas of their life, if not more than one area of their life, or people are kind of like giving into, uh, you know, all the negative things that they, people, that humans can give in, give into. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, I can say I've done some bad behavior a little bit inside of this, inside of this bubble, but I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I mean, the world sometimes needs to take a deep breath, man. We don't come back on the other side. Like when, you know, have you ever feel like sometimes you get sick and it's just like, man, you're, you're on your ass for like three days, but you need it to be because you gotta, you gotta regroup at some point you come back a little bit stronger and you come back a little more clear headed. And sometimes you need that. I don't know whether I'm getting older or more in touch with my body, but if I don't get enough sleep, I know it. I know it the next day. Either if I don't eat enough, if I don't sleep enough, or I don't drink enough water, whatever, you know, yep. those kind of main things or yep. even breathing is probably important too. Can't forget yeah. that. But I feel, especially the sleep thing, I feel like almost like a tingle in my like sinuses or like my, I don't, my something's it's <laughs> off. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. off if I don't get enough sleep. Well, I, I feel like um, you can't get up stronger until you get beaten down a little bit. So I'm kind of taking this whole like nonsense that we've been through in the last couple of years as a beat down. And we just got to figure out a way to come back stronger. Something tells me this is a theme we're yeah. going to be revisiting during this conversation. <laughs> so let's uh, let's get into it. You can tell me about a little bit about your background and, and where you sure. grew up. And I kind of asked people for like real early memories, like even like pre-kindergarten, if anything jumps out at you, images, sounds like, you know, oh my gosh, people, love- most, most, most people don't, you know, well, some people remember uh, pretty far oh. back, you'd be surprised, but uh, you can, you can tell me about your family and, and kind of like a little bit of background where you're from. Sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Well, that's funny, Adam, because you, know, you think about Sherman Oaks and I just immediately where, where, where you're at, I immediately just thought about growing up and I had a wacky growing up like everybody does. My, mine was a little wackier. Uh, when I was born, my mom was 21. My dad was 59. So a bit of an age difference between the two. And it turns out that he was kind of too old to have kids and she was too young to have them. So my sister and I kind of. I wouldn't say we raised ourselves, but we certainly cared for ourselves. 
Um, and gosh, I, I have endless memories of, uh, of growing up near where, where, where you're at right now. And, uh, yeah, it's, it was, it was a good place to grow up. I, I feel really, really fortunate, but yeah, crazy childhood. Um, and you know, it probably, uh, because of that wacky growing up, you know, with my, my dad being so much older than my mom kind of left me out there on my own a little bit. And the crazy thing is when I, when I left uh, a home at 18, um, I just went off on my own and then never looked back just, uh, um, you know, kind of got disconnected from everything and everybody. And if you can believe it, Adam, my car broke down in Vegas and there I stayed for several years. Interesting. Is it, yeah. is that something you were aware of? Like uh, when you were growing up, the age difference in your parents or the, un- that unusual aspect of your family, or, or is it something you look you know, that as you grew older, looking back, you're like, Oh, that's kind of strange. Or as it was happening, did you know, did you know it was, uh, I guess, unusual? Yeah. I didn't know really that it was unusual until like I became a little more aware of myself. I think kids sometimes are really not aware you know, like you're in the moment or whatever, but you don't really have like this third eye, this sense, of, you know, sense of what the heck's going on. I, I do remember, Adam, one story where my mom was off in England and my sister was in Florida, uh, like graduating from high school, like visiting some relatives or something. And I was there, you know, kind of alone with my dad and he was sick. He was really he got really sick. And I remember being in the same room with him and realizing Man, this guy's freaking old. Like he is old, old. And it just hit me at that point. I might have been 15 or 16. And it just hit me. And I I did not handle it well. I I was I was really shaken by it. You know, like I knew my mom was young and kind of aggressive and didn't really like kids, but it didn't really hit me how old my dad was until I saw him sick. And then I kind of realized, holy crap, man, this dude is like old, old. And if I if I could go back. I would say, hey, hey, David, like be a little bit easier on the situation. Like he was probably just doing the best he could. But at the time, I just had no patience for it. I was just I was miserable about it, you know, and and I think, um, you know, I, I you know, when, when a nurse would say, hey, are you here to visit your grandfather? I'd be like, oh, no, it's my dad, you know, and so it was I just didn't uh, I didn't probably handle it as well as I should have. I'm sorry to hear that you had to go through, you know, deal with, deal with all that, that stuff. It's not, it's not fun. And yeah, looking back you, yeah, you want to tell yourself like, you know, it's, you know, it's not your, it's not your fault that, that your, your circumstance is not your dad's fault that like kind of this, you know, I guess we don't choose all of our circumstances in life. No. And, and you know what, uh, you, you only know what you know when you know it. Right. And when, when you know that you could do something different, start to do it different. You can't really beat yourself up about what you did or didn't do in the past. You know, I probably had a habit of doing that a lot. You know, it's like really just beating myself up about making the wrong decision or doing, you know, not taking advantage of the right situation or whatever. Um, until I just found out that, you know, everybody's really not everybody, but really most people are really trying to do the best they can do. And if, if you're like most people, you know what, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to, you're going to do some things that are right. And when you can just choose to do the best thing that you can do. And if, if you give yourself that kind of freedom, then maybe give other people the freedom to not be so perfect, you know, and I'm working um, on it. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm working on it too. It's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's funny. Cause you know, like I, I would hold myself to this crazy high standard because it's like, I had to, be successful at whatever I had to put food on the table, right? There wasn't anybody to turn to, like I had to accomplish these things. And, um, you know, I'm probably made me a little less tolerant to the fact that other people were not doing the maximum that I thought they could do or the best that they could do until I realized, you know what they were, you know, and, and, and geez, you know, you're certainly less than perfect. Allow everybody else to be less than perfect. And so, right. I was going to say, instead of intolerance towards other people for, for their perceived faults, like try to bring them up in some way as well, yeah. maybe a better, a better thought, but that comes with like, I guess, wisdom and experience over time. And it's something that like, like I'm saying, like I'm working on trying to like improve at all these, 
these areas of your, of uh, life. Why don't you tell me kind of more about like what kind of kid you were besides, you know, what kind of things were you into? Were you into oh. like uh, sports or, or art or your, your friends? Like what, you know, socially, what were you into music? Kind of, so, kind of what, what, what kind of yeah, kid were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I grew up, I grew up out in the Valley at a time when punk rock was hitting LA and I was a big rock fan and a punk rock fan. I go see music all the time. Um, you know, I grew up, uh, you know, close to some, you know, Hollywood kids. So I was really into the movies and, you know, um, you know, some comedians and their kids went to school with. And so I was kind of in that scene, but I was really dorky. I was a really dorky kid. I really didn't, I wasn't socially very adept. I, I was overweight. I was kind of like shy. I, I, you know, my, my parents hadn't really given me tools to be myself and be comfortable being myself. And so I wasn't ever comfortable in my own skin. And so that kind of caused me to not be an extrovert really. Um, so I'd say my, my childhood was kind of fun. Like I loved music and I loved, you know, like um, artistic things or whatever, but I really didn't, I honestly, Adam, I really didn't come into my own until like my thirties, man, it took me a long time to really Dude, I'm like, like the same way. I kind of feel like, and, I, and maybe that's not how people perceive me. Maybe it's how some people perceive me, but I kind of like, feel like that. Like I had like a lot of interests and passions, but also like kind of shy and not super comfortable in my own skin, but more so yeah. in my 20, into my late twenties and into my thirties. Like, it's funny that I kind of like, I, 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 I empathize or sympathize or can yeah. relate. Can relate yeah, to you that. can relate. I, I was definitely not one of the cool kids, man. I was definitely not. And I think that um, you can get into a pattern if you are shy or you're uncomfortable or you're socially awkward. You can get into a pattern where you take one step forward and if it doesn't work out the way you hoped it would, it makes you take like three steps backwards. And that was kind of me. And then I, I, I like I mentioned, I, I leave um, um, California and I go embark on my 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 journey i'm gonna go check out these colleges and do whatever and my car breaks down in vegas and literally two days later i'm robbed at gunpoint oh. and uh i got no nobody to call no place to stay um uh i've got uh, no money I, i've just been robbed of everything and i'm i'm like living in my car behind a ralph's um on boulder highway outside of vegas 18 years old not knowing a thing about the world i may be like 11 years old you know mature level and i just tried to figure it all out and so it took me a long time to kind of be at a point where i could look in the mirror and go dude who are you and who the f do you want to be like you've done all this stuff as a reaction to all this things that have happened in your life why don't you just take control and like start to become who you want to become wow that's like how, how do you i mean I guess fill in the gaps from from the point in when you're in the car till till that that conversation you have looking in the mirror and, and well, like and I'll jump in here and there. So listen, you know people, we all know people have made bad decisions, right? Not me, drugs. other people. Yeah, not me. We get into drugs, make bad sure. relationship decisions, bad job decisions. Okay, maybe people, that is me, some of those things. Yeah, yeah that's all of us. Um, and then there's also, uh, how about bad, uh, um, bad timing? Like you, you didn't take advantage of, of an opportunity you could have when you should have, or sure. you, you weren't smart enough to ask the right question to the right person when you were finally given that opportunity or whatever. Right. And you kind of could beat yourself up over all those things. Well, that was me, right. I'm just figuring out how to get through life. And all of a sudden I'm making bad decisions or I'm, I'm missing opportunities or whatever. And so I just felt like I was either always in a hole trying to climb out or I would dig myself a hole so that I can climb out. And I kind of just at one point, like it all kind of happened at the same time. I'm, I'm married to an abusive alcoholic. I got four year old twins and, it, and she's getting bad. Like she's getting bad. bad. And I, I got it. My sister had just called me telling me she's got terminal brain cancer. And I got all this kind of other nonsense going on in my life. And I just went, what the hell, dude? It's either going very south from here or you got to take control. And I mean, I got I got myself, my kids out of that situation, kind of started a dialogue with my sister to try to connect with her on a deeper level. 
And I, I literally, Adam stood in the mirror, just not figuratively, like literally, and went, David, like, who the hell are you and who do you want to be? I was an overweight smoker. I was unhealthy. I was a self-sabotager. I always found the wrong person to be with on purpose, right? Didn't know it, but I always found the wrong person so that I could freaking try to make them better, try to prove to myself how good I was. I was like always trying to be in the wrong social situation so I could prove I wasn't so awkward, right? I'm just all of these things that were just stupid. And I just went like, seriously, dude, who do you want to be? Like, like, why are you this person? Why aren't you whatever you want to be instead of this other nonsense? And that's when I said, well, it'd be kind of cool to like be an athlete. And, you know, instead of wanting to be a writer, why don't you just write? Like instead of, you know, cause I had great opportunities and, 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 in, in Hollywood and, and some other books and other stuff and just never, it just never worked out. And I just said, just stop it. Like just start doing what you want to do and start being who you want to be. It sounds trite. It sounds stupid, but that's, that's what I did. No, that's not stupid at all. That's, that's, I think that's good, good advice and good, good thoughts. And again, like that's a lot of what you're saying definitely resonates with me, especially I think at this this time in in my life, but we can, we can get into that some other time. Uh, Did your, uh, did your sister and conversations with your sister sort of point you in this direction of like this newfound attitude? Where did this come from? It sounds like a lot of it came from just your experience and just like, Mm -hmm. you're getting sick of the, your situation, but was there anyone else that kind of like inspired you along, along the way, like went to of this in this journey well, they, of self-discovery so to speak you know it was a period of time and again you only know what you know when you know it right and and it was so funny i'm going to share something with you i haven't shared with very many people and that is that i was having this crazy fight with my ex-wife okay and she said she screamed at me at one point she's like i'm not your mother and i went oh shit you are you actually really oh my god you're exactly her and i went the hell did you do i mean you literally married your mother like what the heck and it didn't hit me like you could have told me that two days before and i would have laughed you off but it just hit me that that's exactly what i did and it didn't hit me until it hit me and i went wait a second are you making all of these decisions like like completely in a like a delusional vacuum like why aren't you making better decisions and so talking to my sister and she is now going to have to deal with real life stuff, right? She's, she's got a husband, she's got two kids, she's got great job, great friends or whatever. And she's going to have to contemplate um, the fact that she's going to die soon. That's a, that's a heavy thing. That's real. Like you can't be delusional about that bullshit, right? That's real. And so when I, when I kind of said, you know what, I don't want to be in, in this relationship. I, I don't want to live unhealthy. I don't want to be a smoker. I want, I want to connect with my sister. I want to be like, I want to try to live on purpose. Then I just started saying, okay, I got to start making one better decision, one better decision, one better decision. It's not like I was like some kind of loser out of jail addict or something like that, but it's just like, I, I was definitely not being who I wanted to be. Yeah. Well, that's cool that you had that level of self-awareness to, to make, make some changes. Like that's, that's, that's <laughs> 30, good. 36 years or 37 years of not being aware. Right. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden just a light went on and you know, I'll tell you, you what, only know it, when you know, when you know it or whatever. Exactly. <laughs> but, but Adam, look, here's, here's, here's what I did. I literally said, you know what, everything you do, you do because you think other people want you to do it, right? I'm going to act this way because my parents told me I should act that way. External. Act, yeah. I'm going to act this way because it's going to make my teacher like me or my boss like me, or I'm going to do this because it's going to make me a better parent according to whatever anybody thinks a good parent is. And I was doing stuff like looking for everybody else's approval or looking to get rewarded by other people. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there just not even caring about what I, what I care about, what's important to me. And so I just, I just literally just said, come on, man, like start doing it the way that you should do it. Like, like start, start caring about the way that you feel about stuff. Who cares about the way other people feel? What was the first change you, uh, you made like tangible thing that you were able to <laughs> accomplish or, or whenever first thing I, first this, thing I said, was, was, I said this, I go, you're, you're like 40 ish pounds overweight. You're looking in the mirror. You're 38 years old. Like at some point, 
you couldn't look good running on the beach. I want to look good running on the beach. So but I'm a smoker. I'm overweight. I can't run on the beach looking good as an overweight smoker. So I said, I got to quit smoking. So that's the first tangible thing I did. And I said, I can't quit smoking. I've been smoking for 20 years. I never tried to quit because I didn't want to fail at quitting. So, um, <laughs> right. So I, I just said, okay, you got to You got to stop smoking. And what, what, what I thought, what, what, what would get me to stop smoking? I start swimming. You can't swim and smoke at the same time. I, st- I start running. You can't, you can't run and smoke at the same time. So that was the first tangible thing I did was say, okay, I'm going to start running. I'm going to start swimming. I'm going to put down the cigarettes. And then that led to another thing and another thing and another thing. But that was the first thing. It seems like that's, I mean, I've, I've read some stories about people with addiction and, and, and whatnot and, and addictive personalities. Is, is, I feel like it is, you can't just say, I'm going to quit something. You have to t- ha- have another action, another habit, some other good, good, mm-hmm. good habit that, I guess replaces it in, in a sense is like some other action that your physical body can do. It can't just be like, I'm going to stop doing something. That's not, that's not enough. Yeah, you're right. I think for me, it, I, I think I had to envision the fact that I wasn't a smoker. I couldn't just say, don't be a smoker. I had to see, I had to, I'd always see myself as a smoker, right? So that's what I did. I smoked. So, or I saw myself as overweight. That's who I was. I was overweight. So I, I had to see myself as not that. And I couldn't project that's what would, I would look like. I had to be that, right? And so like what you just said, got to replace it with something else. Well, until I could see myself as being athletic, I couldn't get myself there. So I just one step, just one step, one step. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh, yeah, okay, all right, you're athletic. You can run on the beach and not look like an idiot, you know? And so, um, you know, for me, if I stop running right now, I'm not going to pick up smoking again because I see myself as somebody that doesn't smoke, right? So it took it took a long time, but I think you're right with addiction or with bad choices or being in a bad relationship or whatever. You can't just snap your finger and see yourself a certain way. You got to or hope that you're going to be a certain way. It's a lot of work to get yourself to a, like a new reality. It seems like uh, I'm guessing that you when you started to feel and see tangible changes, whether it's your weight or, or something else, like that must've felt pretty good. Like to see, to see the evidence of, of your, mm-hmm. of the choices and changes you're making. Cause there must've been, been proof of it too. Yeah. Yeah. And when I, and, and combine that with doing it for yourself. So I go, okay, I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to start running. And then like a couple of weeks later, I did a 5k, like I ran three miles, like for a guy that had never run in his adult life. Right. And then a couple of weeks later, I did a triathlon and a few weeks later, I did another one. And then a month or two later, I did a half Ironman. And then I did a full Ironman before the end of that first year. And I said, oh my gosh, what can I can continue to do? And I go, dude, well, what do you want to do? I go, I want to run 50 miles. I want to run a hundred miles. Like I want to, you know, bike 300 miles. Where is this? Where is this? First of all, first of all. I did yeah. see your 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 bio and and these physical accomplishments and I I congrats on all of them. I have I have no idea how you're able to do that. Why you want to do all that? What what inspires you to to want to do all that? Because it seems in, insane to me. I mean, why not just exercise and be in shape and and move on to other interests and areas of your life? Why <laughs> why push yourself that far that that often? Ah. Uh. It's a great question. If I would ask you if you are an artist or you're a performer or you're a parent or you're whatever you're trying to do, if you have the opportunity and you really are interested in seeing how good you could be at something, even if it's just for yourself, you'd push yourself as hard as you can do. Right. right. Nobody's gonna nobody's gonna tell you to study more, to you know, uh, uh, do more gigs or whatever. You're just gonna be driven to do it. And so part of me, and that was, this was only a facet of, of who I was and wanted to become, but part of me said, geez, wouldn't it be kind of cool if you could find out what your physical limits were? I, there'd be something neat to find out because at some point I might not be able to find that out, right? My best days might be behind me. So wouldn't it be cool? And, and, and at one point I thought it'd be cool to like do an Ironman. And then I thought, nah, you know, it'd be really cool. It'd be really cool to wake up one day on no training and run a marathon. And then when I did that, I go, you know, it'd be even cooler to wake up one day and on no training, run 50 miles. 
How, wait, and you and you did these things. Oh yeah. yeah. How do you how do you how do you do that without without tra- training? Well, I mean, uh, I was I was fit, right? But right. I wasn't specifically training for those things. You but you can't run fifty out. miles just out of bed. You have to build up to that if you're not. Yeah, but at one point I did. I I I I hadn't been training for anything. I was just like doing my normal whatever, and I go, you know what? I think tomorrow I'm going to wake up and run fifty miles. Wow! If I could be, if I could do that, that's that's being athletic. And so I did it. And then I, the next thing I wanted to do was run a hundred miles, and I did that. And then, um, yeah, and then that led me to thinking I could bike across the country, and I did that. So I just, I wanted to see what's what, what could I do. And my wife just do last night, new stuff. Just, you want to keep doing new things. Yeah, new yeah, yeah. My yeah. wife last night, she just said, "Dude, you got to come up with a new challenge. You got to come up with something big. What are you going to do?" Like, I don't know. I got to start thinking about it, though. What was the last thing? The last thing I did was a the last big thing I did was a yeah. 4,700 mile bike ride. 4,700 mile bike ride. I don't want to. I'll, I'll think on it. <laughs> unicycle. 4,700 mile unicycle ride. Oh, I don't think I got the balance for that, dude. I'm not athletic. Yeah, like I that, just huh? wanted to say the craziest thing I could think of. That was pretty funny. I was <laughs> thinking, like, I don't know if I can take the time off to do this from life, but I think it'd be kind of fun to run across the country. That'd be kind of fun. So, you know who you are? You're like the real Forrest Gump, kind of. Yeah. Are you not? Do, have they called you that? They must have. Yeah, they're like, hey, run Forrest. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not really Forrest Gump. I'm I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that smart or that talented, but but uh, I like to, I do like to push myself and it's kind of interesting because if you could say to your kids, dude, you, you, you could be a world beater. You could be number one at something. If they don't like, those are just words do, but if you go out and do something ridiculous, then you have the right to say, you might as well think outside the box and do something ridiculous. Right. And seeing people set these goals and accomplish these goals and whether it's physical, mental, professional, and to see them push themselves, that has to be, inspiring or motivating you know to people that you touch and are you know connected with in your life just me listening to this i'm like oh my god i have to work harder in multiple areas of my life now just after listening to like am i doing am i am i working as hard as you know the equivalent of the 4700 mile bike ride in other areas of my life probably not but i need i need to work as hard as like a 3500 mile yeah, like, right. That I could do. Like you can't, yeah, you, can. you can't, you can't, you know, push yourself too, too hard, too fast. Right. Except for you, who gets c- crawls out of bed and runs fifty miles. But, but look, Adam, somebody has to be Patton Oswalt, right? Somebody has to be Oprah Winfrey. So, somebody has to be, you know, Tom Brady. Somebody has to be those things. They're not that on accident, man. They are those things on purpose. And you know, as 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 incredible as they are, nobody's telling them they can't do something. They're just electing to do it or not do it. And I, and I think that, uh, that that's an inspiring thing. Like, I didn't understand that. Right. Like nobody tells them, Oh, Michael Jordan, go out and practice more. They just freaking practice more. They had a lot of doubters though. Did, did you, it doesn't even sound like that's what motivated you at all. Is anybody, did people doubt you or be like, think, Oh, you're crazy. You shouldn't do that. You're not going to be able to do that. Did, did you have naysayers and doubters that, that motivated you as well? Or, or is that not even a part of your, your story? Nobody bigger than me. You know, nobody bigger than me for sure. Wow. So that's, I think, I feel like that's unique. I feel like everybody kind of needs like bulletin board material to some degree to, <laughs> to, mo- to motivate them, whatever there's, you know, to, to meet certain well, I, goals. Yeah, yeah I, did, I did, but I don't think that like I, I had any kind of revenge or got you or ha ha ha, I could do this, you know, and you said I couldn't, I kind of not driven by that, but I, I definitely know that I discounted myself and I put my, I, I I took the easy route on not doing big things for myself because I was just like, uh, you know, that that's stupid or you could never do that or, you know, nobody's going to care to, you know, give you that, you know, invest in your screenplay or nobody's going to do that. Meanwhile, you know, if I would have just said just freaking who cares what anybody else thinks, just do it and maybe better things would have happened, you know? Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's ultimately just a battle with, or versus ourselves, I guess. Ultimately, I it's, so. it's, it's kind of what it, what it, uh, what what it comes down to. Why don't you tell me where, sort of where this, uh, what you've up, told me up to this point, kind of crosses with uh, with cycle of lives, and we can kind of get get into that a little bit. Well, sure. So if we're so, up to that point, <laughs> yeah, we're story. there. We're, we're we're at a good point. So, 
So I started this like transformation of becoming like who I thought I could become, right? And 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 who I wanted. Like I, I guess even though it sounds a little cliche, like kind of living on purpose. And um, I like all that stuff. That cliches become cliches because they're probably sort of at yeah. least universal truths to some degree. I, I would I, think. I guess so. I guess so. And so as my sister's going through this 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 issue, and and we're we're talking and we're connecting and we're kind of you know, contemplating what it's going to be like, you know, to die and how she's bummed out about missing out on her kids growing up and kind of real heavy stuff. We're talking about it. Um, she made a um, statement to me that I thought was really amazing. She said, listen, I know I'm going to be gone soon, but there's this event where people are walking around the track for 24 hours and trying to raise money and awareness for what you're going through. Um, you know, it's, it's with the American Cancer Society. And I want to be out there on the track in my tent on a cot watching all of them for the whole 24 hours. She was pretty sick, Adam. And I said, that's pretty inspiring. If you do that, I will be on the track for the whole 24 hours. So you can see me going around for the whole 24 hours. Anyway, she died like two days before the event. Which oh, I'm really sorry. Funny. Yeah, it's really, it's kind of like, really? I mean, you couldn't hang on two more days. <laughs> Poor thing, man. She was, she was really at the end of it. Um, but I still did that, that, uh, that event. And um, I noticed Adam that people were not equipped to talk about the emotional side of this thing, this cancer, this, you know, trauma. If they could talk about like how to get better care or how to have your kids taken care of while you're getting chemo or, you know, where to go for your next pet scan and Logistics. all of this kind of stuff, the tasks, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But not the emotions on it. And I thought to myself, hmm, that's pretty interesting. Why aren't people equipped to talk about the emotional side of it? And then I kind of played with that theme over the years. And I learned more and I learned more and I talked to more people. And it just seemed like this universal truth that people just weren't equipped to talk about the emotions of their trauma. And or if they were equipped to talk or if they if they were equipped to process it, even they still weren't equipped to talk about it. A lot of people didn't process it. Nobody's so, taught really how to do this. If no. you learn somehow from one sort of family or whatever, it's like, it's not really something that our society or, or public education no. really, no. Uh, is, you know, supports or pushes. Yeah. Can I tell you a quick story? It's pre Go for it. this. Go it for it. this a little bit, but during the financial crisis, I guess that was happening about the same time as all of this. My sister just, just passed away. But during the financial crisis, we had, um, I was working in finance. I had about a hundred employees, maybe 40 of them in this one uh, building. And one of the young advisors, wife, young kids, whatever, jumped off the building and um, he couldn't, couldn't handle it. Right. And I flew back from New York. I, I, I go to the office and I, and I walk into the first, and I, I couldn't get a grief counselor there quick enough. And I, and I walk into this office and I'm just like, dude, can you imagine like, who's got like the mindset where you could do that? If I can jump off a building and leave your wife and kids and the family and the whole thing. And he goes, well, let me tell you a story. And he tells me a story about suicide from his youth. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's brutal, dude. I've known you for years. I never knew any of this. I go into the next office and I go, Oh, can you imagine? Blah, blah. And they go, Hey, let me tell you a story. I went from office to office to office. Everybody had a story about suicide. And I'm just like, how, like, how did we not know this? Like, how did I not know that you were dealing with those issues? So everybody had this kind of like, uh, this feeling and this like connection to what had happened with this guy because they had been through some amount of trauma related to suicide. And it kind of made me think that like what you said, we're not equipped to talk about this. We're not taught how it's not okay. Um, we don't know how, even if we, if we knew, thought that it was okay. And we certainly uh, don't want to make other people feel uncomfortable. Right. That's a big guilty. thing. I feel like, right. Yeah. yeah. Being a, a downer, being a burden or, you yeah. know, making things harder or awkward for other people. Yeah. Or how about, dude, I got a wonderful life. And all of a sudden you walk up and tell me that you're, 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 you're one of your family members got cancer. I don't want to sit there and go, well, let me tell you about how great things are for me. Right. But because, you know, so you don't want to make other people feel guilty. You might, you might feel guilty that, that, that things are going well. For, I mean, there's a million things that are preventing us from trying to connect mm -hmm. with people on a level where we could lean in and listen to them. 
or we could relate to them on another level. I'll give them a safe space to talk to us, those kind of things. And that's where I think the beauty of being human is it is is it's in these connections that we can form with people based on our emotions and stories and listening and being grounded and you know centered and that kind of stuff and so that's what what the thought was is why don't i talk to a bunch of people get super deep into their heads and hearts about the things that they had gone through and how traumas affected their ability to process or not process the emotions of cancer either as a patient, a caregiver, a doctor, whatever, and then write those stories out in a way that would allow us as everyday people to understand what people might be going through or what they have gone through so that we can relate to them. And then maybe the next time that we run into somebody who's dealing with something difficult, maybe we'll be better equipped to give them a safe space to talk. That's great. That's, that's, uh, that's quite, quite, quite a story, quite a, quite a journey. And that's all commendable. You know, you should be commended for, for what you're doing, what you're pursuing. And it sounds like you're just kind of like following your instincts within your passions, like really living, like you're really someone who's living an authentic, like true, true life, so to speak. And maybe like you would say that you weren't doing that your whole life, but just like the path that you're on, it seems like like you're saying one with, with purpose, but like, I keep thinking of it like a natural, like the life you were meant to, to live. It's, yeah. It sounds like. It, it does feel, and thank you for that. It does feel more like on purpose and more intentional. I remember like my wife would say to me, she'd walk by and I'd be asking, you know, somebody a question on the phone and afterwards she'd go like, dude, you can't ask somebody that. I mean, that's way too personal. And I'd be like, no, I'm having a personal conversation with him. I, I got to ask him this stuff. How can I not ask him this stuff? She's like, man, I could never ask somebody that question. And it's like, well, if you give people a safe space and you ask them a question, you really want to know the answer and you put it in context as to why you want to know the answer, people will talk to you. And I think that's all we, all we really want is a, is a safe place to talk and to know that somebody's going to listen. And um, I mean, that's what you're doing, right? You're talking about. Sure. What, people and, and who they love and why they love them and what kind of influence they had in their life. And you're giving them a reason to go, you know, the things that are that special to me, you care about your listeners care about, like, that's awesome. Do you know? And so I think that's where the beauty of, of, of being human is, is in those stories and that, and in that connectivity. Yeah. Well said, mind you tell me about some, some examples of that with, with cycle lives and the, and the people that you, that you were able to, to connect with and tell me, and I know that you, rode your bike across the country. Did I read that correctly? Yep. And you yeah. to connect in person with people who had some connection to, yes. to, to, to a terminal illness in yes. one form so, or another. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I had the 15 stories. Well, even though there was a few more, but I hadn't narrowed it down to 15. And I had talked to these people on the phone for a couple of years and most of them for a few years and really knew them, but most of them I hadn't met in person at them. So I, I was like, well, what better way to connect people than to get on my bike and go visit them? So I put together this elaborate scheme to bike, you know, zigzagging up and down the country. Basically, I went L.A. Uh, down to Florida, down to Tampa, across to Orlando, and then up to New York. Um, uh, and so that was the 4,700 miles. So I had met these people that I had been talking to for the first time. And it was pretty emotional because I really, really knew these people and had formed very deep connections with them because I said, well, if I'm going to put Adam's story or the highlights, the major things that we could learn from Adam into a 25 or 30 page story, man, I got to get super deep because it's a hard thing to do. How do you, how do you, put together a, a view of somebody's life in that short of period of time. So uh, um, I had to get super deep with people and there's, there are some great stories, man. There were some, there were some really neat. Yeah. I was glancing there. at a couple of them uh, yeah. that you'd sent me. Yeah. That's, well, that's why wow, that, wow. That must've been pretty, pretty inspiring for, for sure for you. Yeah. It was pretty intense. Um, you know, I'll tell you one story that was, was really, really kind of cool is uh, Dominic. So um, I'm in Vegas going to a music festival 
And my buddy and I are in the back of a car talking about this project. And all of a sudden the driver turns around and he goes, dude, you're writing a book on cancer. I got a story for you. And I'm like, yeah, what is it? And so he told me his story in about two minutes. And I go, dude, we got to talk, right? We got to talk. And so here's this guy who he ends up becoming a very close friend. Um, he just has this, this harrowing life at him, just harrowing, like 19 years old. He passes out on the basketball court. Turns out he's got, he's got just the worst type of cancer stage four, no chance to live. Like imagine wrapping your brain around being told at 19, you're going to die soon, get your shit in order. He survives. Okay. But because he thought he was dead, he, he just becomes like this bad guy. He starts, you know, turn into drugs and crime. He goes to prison. He's got all this nonsense going on. He finally like, he's a good guy, but he's, he finally gets out and, and he's starting to kind of get his life together again. And the cancer comes back and the doctor's like, this is 10 years later. The doctor's like, I know I told you last time you weren't going to make it. And you did this time. There's no way you're going to make it. Oh, right. Boy. And he does. He freaking makes it again. <laughs> right. And I met him probably 10 years removed from that. And his whole theme was his whole life was lived on this, on this idea that he was going to die. Like he just thought he should be dead. He like, you know, so he was told his whole life, he's, you should be dead. So he never lived for tomorrow. He never lived like, uh, like with the thought that he's going to live. So he never opened up to his kids. He never like felt comfortable with who he was. He never felt like people loved him. He just, this, all of this stuff because he, he just felt that he should be dead. So through, I think through our talks and through some other things that happened with him, he decided I'm going to start living and he started journaling. He told his kids the stories and, you know, fessed up to some of the things that he had done in life and why he did that and how he came to terms with it. And he was just a wonderful, wonderful guy. He ended up getting mesothelioma and, and dying shortly thereafter. But when I went to his funeral, Adam, I was just like shocked. There were so many people there and they had so many great memories of him and they had, he had had such an impact on them. And I thought to myself, how cool that in the last couple of years of his life, he was finally comfortable with the fact that he should be happy living instead of thinking he was going to die. How is that not inspiring? It's a very sad story, but it's very inspirational that somebody could kind of make that transformation and make that um, discovery at whatever point in their life that they that they have value and that they have meaning and that they could impact people is it's really very very cool there's tons of those stories in the book yeah that's that's interesting because like although he may not have been on a great path and for the majority of his life but in those last couple of years or whatever it is that you're describing it sounds like that's he touched a lot of people especially in that time period and then those people, mm-hmm. many of them, of course, are still alive and with yeah. his memories and inspiration and, and lessons from him or now with the people's, you know, yeah. that he passed that, that stuff along to. So it's like that impact is still important, even if like he lived 90 percent of his life, not living the best life. He still had huge impact. So it just yeah. goes yeah, to show that it's never too late to to do something positive, to be trite as, as well. Yeah. And also, you know, what's been really cool about this book and, and a lot of people I met Adam was that sometimes you meet somebody and it's one little interaction, one little story where you go, Oh my God, you know, that's pretty cool. Like I can learn from that one little interaction unless you go out and you're paying attention and you're doing it with purpose and intentionality and you're trying to connect with people on a level. Like one of the first people that I kind of talked to you know, at a deeper level, I was in New Mexico on the bike and, and, and I, I would go to this watering hole at the end of the day, I, I want to dive into this little watering hole thing. And I meet this dude and he's this magician pastor. I'm like, well, all right, well, I never heard this of was in thing. Vegas also. No, this was in Albuquerque on my bike ride. Okay. <laughs> and, and, um, um, uh, so I'm on my bike ride. I'm like eight or nine days into the bike ride. I'm uh, like, not quite Albuquerque, but eight or nine days into the bike ride. And, and I, I run into this guy and he tells me he's a magician pastor and he wants to pray for me and for my safety and this kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, and he holds up a coin and he goes, you know, what I'm doing with this coin. And I go, what? And he goes, I've been estranged from my brother for 30 plus years. 
He goes, I never was able to come to terms with it. He goes, I think I'm finally coming to terms with it. He's long dead, but I'm driving this coin across the country. He was from Oklahoma. I'm driving, and his brother was buried in San Diego. He goes, I'm driving this coin across the country, and I'm going to put it on his gravestone and make amends with him. And I went, wow, I'll never, I'll never forget that story, right? Never in a million years will I forget that story that this dude was so happy and and convinced that he was now going to atone for being estranged from his brother by driving across the country and telling people, even strangers like me, what he was doing just to put a coin on the guy's grave. And that that would kind of like settle this, this estrangement issue that he had with him. And I thought to myself, man, that's freaking cool. That's a story that'll never leave me. And that was like a, you know, 10 minute interaction or something. So uh, I'm very lucky that I was able to do this book because it allowed me to start a lot of those kind of conversations, you know? Yeah, for sure. That's great. I feel like that's like, I mean, it, it's just, it's, you could make the argument. It's just like, oh, a symbolic gesture. He's just putting a piece of coin on a thing. It's not going to, doesn't really change anything about reality, but it kind of do, it does or can in a way like those feelings that he had of, of guilt or, or estrangement, whatever issues that he had with his brother. Like if he, if he believes and in his heart that what he did was like, because it required effort, it required travel, it required him to, yeah. to to take the time to to make amends. The the word that you were using, like then then he made amends, and it's real. Like and then he'll be a happier person, and if he's a happier person, he's going to be a better human for all, all the people that he encounters in his life. So it's like, I know who's to, who's cool. to say it's it's just oh putting a coin on a stone. It's it's not. It's like whatever we give you know, meaning and value to in our own lives is, is, uh, is what has value. Like we, we decide. Yeah. And I'll tell you what's kind of cool about it is, and I hadn't really thought about this a whole lot, but how cool is it that I did this project and I did this, this thing, and I could tell you a hundred stories like that, but how cool is it that I'm able to tell you a story about this one little interaction and it, and it kind of is very relatable. Like I can understand what the guy was doing and I think it's very admirable what he was doing. And you know what? He's probably sitting there telling his friends, oh, my God, dude, you never believe what happened. I ran into this dude that was biking across the country, you know, to raise money and awareness and, and help people deal with uh, the emotional side of cancer. How cool is that? So maybe now one little interaction that he, you know, gives him stories to tell. It certainly gives me stories to tell about him. And I mean, I, you know, like what a great what a great side effect from this whole project. Does it, is this is is this all uh is this all a, d- a design is this all like planned like like uh all these interactions pre-planned premeditated and we're just kind of going through the it's like a simulation or or is it uh <laughs> or is it the uh or is it more like up to us to sort of recognize these moments that have meaning and like recognize the even if they're coincidences like find the meaning it's up to us to find the meaning or is it all kind of pre-planned that kind of questions all over the place but i'll kind of let you react to it oh i get your question i totally get your question and and it's it's definitely one to contemplate uh very very uh, deeply so yeah i think it's probably all out there for us it's probably already there it's up to us to recognize it and whether or not we can or choose to or have the tools to, um, you know, um, I, I think, I think for a lot of years, I didn't have the tools to recognize those things. Um, and now, and now I do, do you yeah. know, like, um, so I, I would say that I miss a lot of stuff, but I definitely am more observant, um, and, you know, have, have forced myself into positions that allow me to have these more meaningful interactions. Yeah, I think that's what life is all about. That's what people, that's what, uh, I mean, I think people think about when they look back on, from what I hear is like, you know, when you're old and older and, and, and looking back on your life, it's always the people and always the connections, what people remember. Mm-hmm. It's never like I had this amount of money. It's never anything like superficial. It's always like the people and, and the connections is what, what, what people seem to remember most. Yeah, I, I recently um, heard uh, Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters mention that he, his favorite time about being on stage is when he he convinces the the you know the tax or whoever does it to turn the lights on, and he goes, 
Because when you turn on this, the, the audience lights, he goes, I literally can see every face. He says, and it lets me connect with my audience on a different level because I'm seeing all those faces. And I'm just like, wow, man, to have that kind of connection and, and, and awareness and like, like, like that kind of noticing of other people, that's freaking awesome, right? That's freaking awesome. And so I think what, um, what I wanted to do for a long time and wasn't able to do until you know, maybe five years before this project started was to kind of turn the light on and kind of intentionally see other people and, you know, kind of have those meaningful interactions. And this, this project helped me do that for sure. Yeah. I can't help but also think of like how you hear a lot of former professional athletes from um, uh, team sports. You ask them, what do you miss most about the game? No one ever says winning. No one ever says scoring. No one ever says the money, the fame. They always say the guys, everyone always misses yes. the camaraderie and, and yep. the guys and their teammates. That's always like the number one thing that everyone, you know, oh. retired athletes say. Yeah. And look at when people are done with the hundred shows, you know, they're, you know, the season finality of the seventh season or whatever, and it's the end of the thing, whatever, that's all they remember, right? Is the people that they were, that they were interacting with. And I, I think that that, I mean, that is the beauty of life. If you go out there and expose yourself in a way that is uncomfortable or in a way that's intentional, I, you know, I think that people can have an effect on you and you, you just, you know, you just don't know unless you put yourself out there. And I think, I think that's what I did with this project was just say, okay, I want to, I want to purposely get in people's faces and, you know, shine a light on there and listen to them and see what we can learn from them and then translate that into the written word where I can maybe inspire other people to go, Hey, uh, that allow me to connect with other people in my life. Do you know? That's awesome. That is a great yeah. approach to, to all this. What's uh I'll, you know, definitely want to get your plugs and promote the book and all that stuff yeah. in, a, in a moment for sure. But what, what is, what is next? I mean, you said you were kind of not sure about what your next physical fitness right. uh, challenge will be, but what about uh, writing or, or, mm -hmm. or, or, or personal? I was looking at your bio. We didn't even scratch the surface because I know you've had it worn a million hats and had right. a million professional pursuits over the years, but what's, yeah. uh, what's next for you in, in life or professional or writing or otherwise? Sure. Well, th thanks for asking. If I'm lucky, I'll keep writing. Uh, I have many, many projects that I want to do and then I'm in the middle of doing. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, as performers, right? I mean, I know a lot of your stuff's uh, 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 around comedians, right? Um, you know, as performers, they're, all, they're always afraid that they're not good enough, right? And, and people have like this, this kind of imposter syndrome and nobody's going to find me funny or, you know, I'm just this awkward person and, you know, it's, it's accidental any success I get. Cause it's not me, but like, like when you know that you're good at something, like I know this book is good. Maybe the editors made it good, but, it, but at least it's good. Right. I know that. And so I want to keep putting out books that are good um, because I want to tell stories and, and um, connect with people on that level. So that's what I'm hoping is next is just continue to come up with more books, um, continuing to uh, be able to talk to great people like you and well, I appreciate you know, that spread the word and make an impact like what you're trying to do, right? What you're going to do is inspiring somebody to, you know, do something differently or do it more on purpose or spark some kind of creativity or some kind of insight uh, and, and to be a part of that is, is pretty, pretty spectacular. So that's what I'm hoping to do. That's, that's cool. Sounds like you're going to be, you'll be a bit, you'll be a busy man uh, for sure. in one, in one yeah. form or another. Yeah. Why don't you tell people where they can uh, find, uh, find, follow you, or, uh, plug, promote, sure. I'll give you uh, give you the floor for that stuff. Oh, well, thank you. And there's, so there's two reasons why one is hopefully um, if you buy the book, um, uh, wherever you want to buy it, Amazon, you know, on my website, Barnes and Noble, whatever, I'm hundred percent of the net proceeds are going to support the charities that were picked by the book participants. Um, so, um, I'm not making any money off the book. It's all going to the charities. So that's one thing that's a positive. The second uh, thing is that hopefully, uh, if you do get a chance to read the book, uh, maybe it would allow you to have a conversation with somebody that wants you to have a conversation with them. Maybe you both don't know it yet. Right. But now you'd be better equipped or a better listener or ask better questions. So 
Um, you could connect with me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, just look up cycle of lives or David Richmond or whatever. And um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Very cool. Good stuff. It's like a, it's like a, you'll, you get a skill like talking to, talking to people, I think who've gone through trauma or dealt with trauma about the trauma. Like that's a very, that, that is a challenge. And that's something that really should be taught and is something that needs to be learned. And through this book that you're, you've written definitely sounds like that could be a, a reference for that, for this type of thing to learn, learn a skill in a sense of valuable useful skill. And I feel like I've kind of like just through this podcast, like some of the, some of the comedians and people I've interviewed definitely have, have had like crazy backgrounds for sure. And, yeah. you know, I've had other conversations with, with people who've dealt, been touched by cancer or death or told me that they've lost parents or very close ones. And it's, and it's, it's something I, I just, I learned and, and, and aspire to, to get better at having those types of of conversations like you know we're, we're human yeah it's hard but these are all universal things and we need to be able to to talk about them to to process them i guess yeah and and look i think that it's better right it's certainly easier when somebody tells you something really difficult like that they went through it's easier to say oh i'm sorry and then walk away that's easier Right. It's, it's hard to say, oh, my gosh, like, tell me more. Oh, my gosh. You know, were you close to that person? Oh, my gosh. I like, like, what happened? Like, how are you feeling about it? Or, like, gosh, do you want to talk about it? Because I'm here if you do. And if you don't, no worries. But that, yeah, that's a big thing. That's a good way to hard, put it, man. It's hard to do that, right? Yeah, no, it is. But people probably do want to talk or they don't know how to even talk. It's. Life is hard. Life is twisted, my friend. But I'm going to let you enjoy the rest of your your evening. And I definitely appreciate the time and the stories. Yeah. I'm inspired. I'm excited to to dig into the book more myself and into into. I'll probably start like looking up the people that you're written about and yeah. then checking out their their charities and stuff and sure. stuff like that and, and go from there. But again, thank you, David mm-hmm. Richmond, for the time. It's been fun. Yeah, Let's uh, you got it. Let's uh, talk soon. All right. Thanks, Adam. You're good at what you do. So keep doing it. Man. Oh, thank awesome. you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Keep doing it. You got to talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye. So there you have it. My conversation with David Richmond. Wow. That was just amazing and inspiring. I'm not sure what to say. David's desire to connect with others is just great to see. And his life really seems to capture the best of what the human spirit has to offer. I really do thank him for taking the time. But anyway, for everything about this uh, show, of course, head to peoplewelovepodcast.com. That's at peoplewelovepodcast on Instagram. I'm at Adam Choit on Instagram and Twitter. I think that's about all I got for today. I appreciate you guys listening. Thanks as always, and uh, let's talk soon. Peace. 